delighted that we are delighted that as of early this afternoon, there were 72 community members signed up for the webinar. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by the Yellow Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice, a Cool Davis Working Group, the City of Davis, and Cool Davis. And thanks, many thanks to the Congregation Bed Harbor Reams Sustainability Task Force for coordinating this effort in conjunction with the other congregations in the Interfaith Alliance. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Cool Davis YouTube channel. Any, everyone who registered will receive the link to the Zoom recording if they want to refer back to the presentation. Tonight introduction, tonight's introductions will be brief so that uh, so that we can get through the presentation. Um, and because you're here really to, to you're here, Jennifer. Our housekeeping items, as I mentioned earlier, for those who weren't here, there are only two. Um, if you're not muted, please mute your microphones. And as your questions arise, please submit them in the chat box. Uh, I will read your questions to uh, Jennifer after the presentation, and uh, we will uh, address as many as our uh, time allows. Now, let me introduce to you uh, Lynn Nettler, coordinator for the Yolo Interface Alliance for Climate Justice. Lynn will give us a few words about the Interface Alliance, read our land acknowledgement, and introduce our speaker. Lynn? Good. Good evening. How nice of you all to come. Hope it's a great evening for you. I just wanted to share the mission of the um, YOLO Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice. If you've not run into it before, are you hearing me? Yeah, it's working, good. Um, and it is to inspire our faith communities and our city community to work together to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, to educate ourselves on climate issues and to speak out for climate justice. Tonight, is one of many speakers we have offered to the community over the last 12 years. Many of our previous events are available on the DMA DCTV and also the Cool Davis YouTube channel. I think the land acknowledgement is next. There you go. This is a native land acknowledgement. As we begin, We'd like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putuan people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putuan tribes, the Kachildehi tribe of Wintun Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, the Kletseldehi Wintun nation, and the Yochadehi Wintun nation. The Putuan people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. I have the privilege of introducing Jennifer Gilbert. She is our City of Davis Conservation Coordinator and she works in public works, utilities and operations. I met her way back when Cool Davis was just forming and have relied on her expertise ever since. Even for our very first, first public event, the Cool Davis Festival in 2010, we wanted to make sure it was waste free. Jennifer guided us through all the steps and I've relied on her since to make events of all kinds and all sizes from meetings to huge public events waste free. Most important, Jennifer has guided our city to make our home garbage collection, including recycling of all kinds, plus green waste pickup. She's the one who sends us clear communications of what to do with the various items we no longer want or need. She even helps with signage for events. How fortunate we are to have such a committed expert to guide us to recycle and reduce our landfill contributions. I'm so pleased you all get to meet Jennifer tonight. I'm certain you'll leave grateful for this dedicated public servant. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Lynn. That was beautiful. 
Um, so hi, I'm Jennifer Gilbert, and I am honored to be uh, working here at the City of Davis. I've been here for, uh, oh my gosh, 16, 17 years, I don't know, um, talking trash. I absolutely love talking trash. I tell everybody I have the best job. I get to talk trash every day, and I love it. And I, so many people are here. I'm, I'm sure your guys are super pumped up to hear about trash, too, and recycling and composting and why that all matters and climate change and how does trash interact with climate change and what is what we throw away how does that change you know what what happens with our climate and and um, greenhouse emissions and all that so we're going to talk about the connection between the waste we throw away and how that impacts the climate how our personal decisions can make big changes what's changing in in government and law that's having an effect on on trash and where you know how are we changing um how it's affecting the climate as well so in just a second uh, we'll get the powerpoint up and we can uh, oh perfect thank you so much um and we can uh, talk about how how trash interacts with the climate because it's some of you might already know some it might be surprising to a few others um but we'll kind of dive into it um so uh, chris if you can go to the first slide um on the presentation and we can go ahead and um so i'm going to start to talk about you know how trash impacts the climate and then we'll talk about um the can you go to the the first one chris this is i think slide like six or something i'm so sorry i have a really long presentation but i swear i'm a fast talker so we'll get through it real quick um a little bit further back okay so uh, further back yeah this is i think slide six or something there, there we go, go. Perfect. thank you <laughs> okay all right so you can go to the next one now <laughs> that, that's me i'm jennifer gilbert Okay, so we're going to talk about trash and climate change. We're going to talk about what organics are, and that's really critical to understanding climate change and trash is to understand what organics are, because um, it might not be what most people think of as organic. Then we're going to talk about how the state is actually making some huge strides towards solving some of these climate issues that we have regarding trash with the um, Senate Bill 1383 regulations, which has been my life the past four years. Um, then we're going to kind of delve into how Davis does waste collection, where our waste goes, how we recycle things, and then the most frequently asked questions that we get about waste, because that's one of the, my favorite things that I get to do with my job is I get to answer all the fun questions about where does this thing go that I have, I want to get rid of it, what do I do with it. Okay, next slide please. So to start with, let's talk about trash and climate change. Um, can we get the next slide please, Chris? Um, so we know that the stuff that we go throw away goes someplace. But what is that? What is that? Where is that a connection between trash and climate change? So a lot of folks understand that you know when we recycle something, we're not taking those virgin materials out of the ground or you know from trees and such. We're we're using our waste, and that process alone, you know, recycling our, our raw materials instead of harvesting virgin materials, that alone has positive um, climate impacts, right? It's it's a lot less impactful to recycle something than it is to harvest something. But there's a bigger issue at play here. Next slide, please. And the bigger issue at play really has to do with, with specifically with greenhouse gases exactly. Now there's two main greenhouse gases and a lot of you are much more knowledgeable about this than I am, okay? This is not my forte. My forte is trash. But what I do know, next slide please, is that between carbon dioxide and methane gas, methane gas is worse. It's 84 times apparently something more, more potent than carbon dioxide, right? So when the state is looking at trying to uh, you know, deal with the climate crisis, they're looking at how can we reduce these, these items that are in our atmosphere. How about that methane? That's pretty bad. Where's all that methane coming from? And a lot of people point at cows. And yes, methane does come from cows. Next slide, please. But the crazy thing is that 20% of our methane gas actually comes from landfills, which is a strange place to think of methane coming from. But that's because as organic materials, and we'll talk about what organic materials are in just a few minutes, as organic materials decompose, it produces methane gas when it's decomposed anaerobically in a landfill cell. Now, what's interesting is that the state has done studies and they found that half of what we send to landfills is organic waste. So we're filling landfills with organic materials that are decomposing and producing methane gas. Now, yes, we have methane gas capture systems on landfills that can pull out a lot, but not all of that methane gas and we can generate energy from that, but it can't collect all of it. 
And so what's happening is we're throwing waste away, it's fermenting in landfills, it's releasing methane gas. So not only is it wasteful behavior, not only are we having to harvest raw materials to make up for these resources, but we're also directly contributing to the climate crisis by producing all this methane gas in landfills. So what are we going to do? Next slide, please. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Chris. So what is organic waste? What are we throwing away that's making this issue? Well, meth organic waste is not what most people think of. A lot of people, and you guys might know differently, right? But when I talk to people, when I talk to you know people, they go, oh, well, I don't, I don't have organic waste. I don't purchase organic produce. Organic waste, we're talking scientifically, means something that comes from a plant or an animal. It's carbon-based, okay? So what does that mean? That means things like paper, cardboard. Next slide, please. It can even mean things like yard waste. So these things, this is organic waste. Next slide, please. It can mean food scraps. Next slide, please. It can mean meat and fish and bones and eggshells. All that kind of stuff is also organic waste. Next slide, please. It can also mean the food that has spoiled in our fridge or you had people over and someone left a plate of food and we don't know whose it is, so we don't wanna eat it. That, that's also organic waste. And think of all the stuff that we throw away regularly. Next slide, please. The one that really gets people surprised is this stuff takeout food. So anytime you have paper takeout food packaging, it's paper, right? That's organic waste. Think how much paper towels your, your family throws away or Kleenex, right? You blow your nose. Oh my gosh. How many bins in our, in our offices at work are full of paper towels or Kleenex or your coffee cups or napkins or takeout food packaging? All of this is organic waste. Our landfills are half full of all these different types of organic waste. Next slide, please. So what we like to say at the city is if it grows, it goes. So if you think about an item that you want to throw away, and if it primarily came from, and when I say primarily, you got to think about at least 95% content was from an animal or plant so that grew, then it can go into the organic spin. We'll talk about a little bit more about the details and the nitty gritty of that later. But organ your organic spin, you should have something like this at your house if you live in Davis and oh my gosh, that one has a green lid. Why does that have a green lid? Mine doesn't have a green lid. We'll talk about that too. But you should have one of these organic spins where you live, no matter where you live in Davis. It's state law, it's mandatory. It's been mandatory in Davis since 2016 that you've got these green bins. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the thing. The state has realized that this is an issue with the organic waste in landfills. So in 2016, the governor signed SB 1383, Senate Bill 1383, short-lived climate, climate pollutants um, to reduce the methane emissions coming from landfills. Uh, you know, I have to tell you a funny, funny little story before I go any further. When I was in third grade, I remember reading that the city, that the state of California was gonna recycle 50% of all its waste by the year 2020. I distinctly remember reading about that in third grade and saying, oh my gosh, when I grow up, I want to check back and see if the state did that because that would be amazing. And guess what? Here I am now, and I am literally the person who is doing that for the city of Davis. And that legislation back then was so landmark. We've never seen anything like that in California. This law is the so that was a, a that was AB eight uh, nine thirty nine. Okay, this law. SB 1383 is the new AB 939. Again, completely landmark legislation. We've never seen anything like this and you'll see in a little bit why. Because over the years, the state has tried to put more and more laws out. Okay, businesses have to recycle, apartments have to recycle, cities have to have these kinds of recycling programs, cities and counties have to have these kinds of recycling programs. But despite all of the state's efforts of reaching that 50% diversion by 2020, it's going the other way. Way. So while Davis and Davis, we recycle 60 on, on a given year, it varies anywhere from 62 to 67 percent recycling in Davis, which is fantastic. We're keeping a lot of stuff out of the trash statewide. It's like 45, 35. It's going the wrong way statewide. So the state is looking at things and saying something has got to change in a big way to make sure that this stuff is not going to the landfill. It's not just much about reducing resources at this point or saving resources. We're in a climate crisis. Something has seriously got to change. And so they passed this law. Next slide, please. So what's amazing about this law is that it is the most complete law I have ever seen come out of the state. This is the full circle that is SB 1383. It has six main elements and we're gonna cover these super fast because I know we've got a lot of fantastic questions in the chat and I'm gonna try my best to answer them. Okay, next slide, please. This, this law has been my life. I participated in the rulemaking process 
We submitted comments and questions to the state. They actually changed the regulations based on our comments and questions. Um, I've been very, very involved with this law. The state asks me to speak about this law at statewide webinars because I am so passionate about this. This is really what's gonna make a big difference. And I am super excited to be part of this here in Davis. Um, so the first element of this law is that all jurisdictions, cities and counties have to have an organics and recycling collection program. But the state has learned that just saying that you have to do something is not good enough. So they have got to the nitty gritty. This law is over 120 pages long. It's taken people years to even understand the concepts of all these elements of this law. It is completely nitty gritty. They did focus groups and they realized that one of the challenges that people have in the state of California is that you don't know which ones are recycling bin. If, I, if we were in person, I would tell you, raise your hand if you've ever gone someplace and you've seen something that you think is a recycling bin, but you're not sure, and you're not sure what you can put in there. We've all been there, right? I think that's an organics bin, but I don't know. Can I put a paper towel in there? I'm not sure if they can do that here. Can I recycle my, 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 my thing that I have here, here? I'm not sure if that's a recycling bin. The state recognizes that that's a challenge. So they said, okay, hold up, hold up, hold up, stop. So not only do y'all have to have a recycling program, your recycling bins have to be blue and they have to have a label on them. Oh, if you don't have a, if you don't have a, a blue bin, if you've got a green bin, that's, oh, you know, okay, fine. But you have to have a label on it that says what you can and cannot put in that bin. Cities and counties though, when you have a program and you're rolling out carts to everybody, the recycling bins have to be blue, organics bins have to be green, trash has to be brown or gray or black or gray, sorry. They're very, very specific, very specific. We have existing bins that are completely different colors than that. We live in Davis. Our recycling bins for businesses are green and our brown lidded recycling carts. Oh, we got all the wrong colors. It's okay. The state is giving us until 2036 to change all those out because they recognize, hey, if everybody all of a sudden just went and threw out all of their bins and got all new bins, how environmental is that? Like that doesn't work at all. So they're like, you guys have until 2036 to replace them over time through attrition because you're going to need to replace them anyways. But eventually, statewide, everything is going to be the same color. Everything is going to have labels. It's going to be uber clear. OK, next slide, please. The next thing they realized, oh, this is the exciting thing. OK, so this is what waste collection looked like in Davis as of December 2022, OK? or sorry, December 2021, my apologies. This law went into effect, I should say, January 2021, two. I'm so sorry. I've been working in this law for so long. It went into effect last January. So we're on year two right now of this law. So as of the end of December in 2021, this is what waste collection looked like in Davis. We have a cornucopia of pretty color bins here, right? Commercial recycling bins are green, organic split bins have a brown lid. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the future. Behold the future of Davis waste collection. Everything's gonna, all the recycling bins are gonna be blue. Because we have two recycling bins, right? We keep our paper separate from our bottles and cans. And the law actually specifies if we do that, the paper bin has to be dark blue and the bottles and cans have to be a light blue. We don't get to pick. The state has already decided this for us. So this is what you're gonna start seeing this in town. And I don't know about you, I notice it, of course, cause it's me and I'm looking for this stuff. Start keeping an eye for this. You'll see it as you drive around town, these beautiful, I think beautiful, bright blue bins to make it very easy which one is which. The problem, of course, is as we're transitioning, there's all kinds of colors out there and it's going to get a little confusing. Check the labels. Recology has got some fantastic labels on their new bins with full color, with pictures, bilingual and such. So it's going to be great. It's going to be great. We just got to stick through it until eventually all these bins get replaced. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next element of this new law that's going to make it so much easier is that not only do cities, but even businesses are required to monitor their bins for contamination. Because, right, it's one thing to have a bin, right? We all got bins. How many people, all the businesses, how many apartment communities, how many homes use all their bins correctly? So this another part of law says actually the city is responsible for monitoring the bins. We have to do lid flipping or take a look inside the bins once a year, we have to do a statistically, you know, sampling, whatever, however many homes we have to, and businesses, we have to just lift the lid. We're not touching anything. We're not taking pictures. We're just looking to see if stuff is sorted right. If it's not sorted right, we'll put a little tag. Oh, almost. Let's sort this out. We can do a little bit better. If they're doing great, they get a, hey, good job tag. Um, so we, that is something that's going to happen um, soon, hopefully. 
Uh, and then businesses are required to keep an eye on their contamination as well. Next slide, please. The next thing, of course, is education outreach, because if people don't know how to do stuff right, they don't know how to do stuff right, and they're not going to do stuff right. Now, fortunately, our, the City of Davis program has a great outreach program. We're very fortunate that we are almost already completely compliant with this requirement of the regulations, but there was some tweaks we had to do and some changes, which we're working on. But all businesses have to um, educate their employees, their tenants, their contractors annually as well about the recycling stuff. So it's not just my job anymore to tell everybody how to recycle. Everybody has to take ownership. This is our waste. We have to make sure that our folks know how to recycle as well. Um, next uh, slide, please. But the state also recognized that what good is telling people that they have to collect stuff for recycling and composting if there's no place to send it to? So another, another. this is again why this law is so amazing, is because they require that there is a capacity planning element to this. We had to do a capacity study to make sure that when we're collecting all this organic waste, there's a place that can go to. We have to have a contract with a, with a composting facility. Fortunately, the Yola landfill just opened up a big old composting facility, so we have a contract, it all goes there. There's also an element of this regulation um, to food recovery, which we'll talk to in a little bit, but we had to do a study to make sure that we have capacity in Yolo County for all of our edible food that we're collecting to get um, to people that need it through the hands of food recovery organizations. Um, next slide, please. And of course, what good is collecting and processing things if there's nothing to take it on the back end? So Cal Recycle, the state also wrapped in procurement. So not only do jurisdictions have to collect all this stuff and, and make sure it goes someplace, but we also have to purchase it back. So we are, the city of Davis, uh, they actually um, state modeled their paper purchasing requirement off of the city of Davis's requirement. They actually asked me to send them our purchasing policy. So um, we're models, Davis is amazing. <laughs> Um, they so we have to purchase statewide. Every all the jurisdictions have to purchase recycled content paper. We, jurisdictions should have been doing that already. Davis already was. Um, we have there's a lot of record keeping that's involved in it now, so that's a little bit of a pain. But it's okay. It's getting us towards those goals. And then we also have to recover some of the organic waste products, so compost and mulch or or energy or something. So when all that stuff goes to be composted, we're getting some of that back as well, and and making sure that it's that we're supporting the system, we're closing that loop. And then last slide, and of course, you know, reuse and feeding people is much better than um, composting food. So part of the element is that they, the, the state wants to see edible food coming from grocery stores and eventually in 2024 from restaurants, um, they want to see that being um, sent back to people who need it instead of being composted or thrown away. So there's a whole edible food recovery component of this regulation as well. So that's that's as much as I want to talk about the details of, of SB 1383. Um, next slide, please. There are a lot of specific requirements um, for businesses. Oh, I guess, sorry, that's the next slide I'll talk about. So we are, this is a lot, okay? That I, I, I glazed over all the details. Those are just the main components. Each one of those details has like 50 subparagraphs and 15 different details to each of those subparagraphs that the city has to keep records on and maintain records on and all this stuff. So literally, like I said, this is my past four years I've been doing this. Um, we are way far ahead of this, fortunately, because we've had mandatory recycling and mandatory organics collection since 2016. So that's a fantastic thing for us. It's just a lot of extra details, a lot of extra uh, making sure that, you know, the bins are blue and the bins are green and there's labels and stuff like that. Um, and as I said, because the state realized that other options were not working. So I truly believe that this is going to make a difference, especially because, next slide, the changes for businesses are pretty intense. Um, a lot of our waste does come from households, but of course, a significant portion does come from businesses as well. So to make sure that that businesses are, are sorting their waste and stuff, there's a lot of details in the new law, and I'm not going to read all of these because there's a lot um, for businesses to know and how to sort their waste and how to, to provide education and provide bins and stuff. So to make this as simple as possible for our businesses in Davis, we've created a series of videos on YouTube that we give to businesses. I've emailed them to many times that they can share with their, um, their contractors, their tenants um, and, and their employees. Um, we have free bins that we give them. These bins that are, are shown here and those labels, we give out to businesses for free. Um, we just, we sent out a notice, I think in February, a postcard with a QR code so that they can get to this page on our website and order all these free bins. Um, so we make this as easy as possible. We do provide site visits as well to businesses and we go through a checklist with them to help them get them on board with how to um, comply with the state regulations and to sort their waste properly. So 
it's going to take a lot of work, but I'm really hopeful. Like literally everything that I've been trying to do since I started with the city, it's like, oh, if only, you know, if only that we could do this, if only we could do this, this law really gives us all the tools that we need to have this actually work. Um, it requires the work of five people and we are definitely not staffed at five people, but we will, we are doing the best that we can. And I'm, I'm super excited that, that the state is moving in this direction. Okay, next slide. So let's um, shift a little bit and talk about specifically in general, waste collection in Davis. Cause I know a lot of you wanna know specifically about how do I recycle this thing? Or how do I, why do we do things this way in Davis? Why do we have to put our paper separately? Do you really keep it separate? I see it all go in the truck, the same truck. Okay, so Davis does waste collection a little bit different. Um, so Recology is our waste collector. They're a private business. Um, Davis Waste Removal sold their business to Recology some years back. Um, we have been curbside recycling in Davis for 49 years. It has been mandatory recycling for a very long time. Yes, I know, 49 years. Next year's 50 years. I'm super excited about celebrating 50 years. Um, we had plans to celebrate the, city, the city's 50-year um, recycling program was in 2020. And that's when they just first started just collecting recyclables um, was in 2020. And I had all these plans for just a big celebration. And then of course the pandemic hit. So we put all those plans on hold and we will we will celebrate next year when we celebrate the curbside recycling uh, for 50 years of curbside recycling. But yes, we do dual stream recycling. We do keep paper separate than bottles and cans and I'll show you how we do that. Um, next slide, please. So um, you, you have an organics cart. You live in Davis. As I said, it's a little bit confusing right now with the cornucopia colors. You might, your organics cart might look like any one of these here. It might have, it might be gray with a brown lid. It might be gray with a green lid, or it might be a solid green bin. Either way, that is an organics bin in Davis, okay? And we've kind of talked a little bit about the kind of materials that you can put in there, but if it grows, it goes. And we like to look at, when you're looking at something and you're trying to determine if it should go into the organics bin, Two things to keep in mind. So one, it, it really should be almost entirely completely compostable, right? Ideally, in a perfect world, it should be ASTM certified or BPI certified compostable in a perfect world. That's, we don't live in a perfect world. <laughs> um, so if it has a little bit of non-organic material, a little bit of plastic, it's okay. It's not ideal. It is currently, and I'll get to why currently, but currently okay to put that in the organics bin. But just keep in mind, whatever we put into the organics bin is going to be spread on farms um, and, and taken into our community and used in gardens. So just you know, be mindful, don't put it in a plastic bag, please. Plastic bags are not compostable. Compostable bags are compostable. Next slide, please. Um, and then of course we have the recycling bins and we're gonna get into details about what goes in these bins as well. But as I said, it's going to be a little confusing for a while about these recycling bins because some of them have black lids, some of them have blue lids, some of them have both blue lids. We have dark blue, we have light blue, we have green. Again, look at the labels on the carts. If you're ever confused, if the labels have come off your carts, call Recology. They will replace your labels. That's their job. If the label is gone, let them know. They will replace the label. Um, but yes, we do keep bottles and cans separate. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about how we actually do that. <laughs> Um, so if you live in a single family home, your bins look like this. Next slide, please. And that, that split recycling cart. So it has two lids and it has a hinge in the little, the lid and the lids kind of, it's hard to do. Here we go. Like this, the lids flip up like this, right? like a butterfly. Next slide here. Um, the good thing about that is when the truck picks it up and empties it up, this is a fun picture to take. <laughs> when the truck empties it uh, upside down, the lids direct the materials inside the cart into different chutes. So it keeps it completely separate because those are completely two different chutes. And next slide, please. It goes into two different compartments of the truck. The trucks are actually divided down the center and it has two, I always want to call them lids for the doors on the back of the truck that open independently. So the truck can drive over here, empty all the paper, then close it and then drive around the back, empty all the bottles and cans. Um, next slide, please. And I think I actually have a picture that shows that. Oh, and then it's a uh, hand sorted here in Davis. Yes, hand sorted here in Davis. Crazy. Many of you might have actually been able to see this process happening. It's kind of cool. Next slide, please. So paper, we can put paper, any kind of paper, paper box, cereal box, newspapers, junk mail, pretty much anything that comes in the mail, almost. <laughs> There's some really creative advertising these days with plastic mail, it drives me nuts. Um, there's a little credit card things, take the little credit card out and the rest of it can go in. The little glass, the paper, the plastic windows on envelopes are fine, 
that's fine. Don't worry about that. Staples are fine. Paper clips need to be removed. Um, but other than that, this kind of stuff is all fantastic to put in your recycling bin for paper. Um, next slide, please. Um, when it comes to uh, paper products that we cannot put in, so here's the key to remember with paper, okay? If you have a paper thing, a paper object, okay, and its intent was to be used with food or beverages, or if it is a paper thing that has come in contact with liquids or foods or beverages, you cannot recycle it, but you probably can compost it. Okay, so think about a paper towel, it's paper, but its job is to come in contact with liquids, not recyclable, but you can compost it. Paper plates, its job is to come into contact with food, cannot recycle it, but you can compost it. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If its job is to come into contact with liquids, foods, or beverages, don't recycle it, but you can compost it. Okay, next slide, please. So when we talk about metals that we can recycle, in general, a lot of it is, is food and beverage metals again, um, but there's some non-food and food uh, beverages or food, I'm sorry, I start work so early. There's some non-food and beverage metals that we can recycle like uh, empty aerosol cans, as long as it's empty, empty paint cans, as long as the paint is dry, we can recycle those metals um, in your recycling bin. Just uh, clean and dry is the, is the best option for you. So don't throw it through your dishwasher, but give it a good scrape or just put some water in it and shake it and empty it out. So rinsing is good. You don't again, don't put it through your dishwasher, but just kind of make sure it's fairly clean. Next slide, please. Um, so yes, yeah, so tin foil things like this are fantastic. Just make sure they're clean. You don't want a ton of cheese and lasagna stuck on that. Next slide, please. And then for glass, um, glass, it is critical that it is only food and beverage container glass. Only, only, only food and beverage container glass. Next slide, please. If you have a broken glass or a broken dish, a broken picture frame, a broken window, those cannot be recycled. Those have to go into the trash. It's a different type of glass. It often has plastic on it. It's tempered at a different degrees, you know, different temperature. Um, it cannot go in your recycling bin. So only food and beverage container glass. So glass pickle jars and glass bottles, stuff like that. Next slide, please. Plastics. Okay. I'm sure if, again, if you were in person, I'd ask for a show of hands, how many people ever get frustrated with plastics? You are not the only one. Next slide here. Here's the crazy thing about plastic. You know that recycling symbol that's there with a the little number inside? That's yeah, not a recycling symbol. Totally not a recycling symbol, right? That, that's the frustrating thing. That number just tells the plastics industry what type of plastic it's made out of. Like the consumer cares. We just wanna know what to do with it. Next slide, please. So here's the thing. In Davis, we can recycle what we call rigid plastics. That number on the container, forget about it. Don't even look at the number on the container because that same number one that you see on a plastic bottle, you're also going to see in a plastic bag that's not recyclable. You might see it on a toothpaste container, which is not recyclable. Ignore that number completely, <laughs> okay? Look at the plastic item that you have. Is it a rigid plastic? Does it hold a shape? Or is it film or foam? Okay, so foam, think about styrofoam and packing peanuts um, or like a plastic film, like a plastic bag or saran wrap. Or if it's something funky and it doesn't really seem like a rigid plastic, we can recycle rigid plastics, okay? If it's not a rigid plastic, we cannot recycle it. And we'll go into a little bit more about these funky things that people are texting about or chatting about, about milk cartons and toothpaste tubes and stuff. We'll talk a little bit about that later too. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, here we go. There we go. There's some things we can't recycle. We can't recycle gloves or masks. We can't recycle styrofoam. We can't recycle plastic bags. These are not rigid plastics. These have to go into the trash. Okay, next slide, please. Um, cardboard boxes. Oh my goodness, don't we have a lot of cardboard boxes these days? Okay, so here's the funny thing. Cardboard recycling is a completely separate thing than everything else that we put into our bin. Next slide, please. When you have a cardboard box, flatten it. Do not put it in your recycling carts. Now, how crazy is that, right? We thought we had to put it in the cart. If you have a tiny little box and it's really small, the, the, the um, city municipal code actually says two, uh, uh, two um, square feet of cardboard or less. If it's two cubic feet or, or less of cardboard, go ahead and put it in your bin. So if it's tiny, but if it's too big, that's gonna get stuck. <laughs> it's, either not, it's either gonna get stuck in your cart and Recology will like not be able to get it out or if it goes into the Recology cart, it's gonna get stuck in the hopper and the truck driver is gonna to have to get down and like 
like shove it in and take it out and stuff. It's kind of a mess. So don't put it in a recycling cart if you have a big piece of cardboard. Next slide, please. If you have a big piece of cardboard, also please don't stack it in between the carts. We see that a lot. Uh, next slide, please. Because here's the thing, the trucks actually have to grab your cart. <laughs> and if there's cardboard right there, they can't really grab it with the truck thing. I mean, the drivers are pretty amazing, but it's a lot harder when there's a big stack of cardboard. So what you wanna do is put it on the ground next to the, the carts. Uh, next slide, please. Just let's leave it on the ground next to the carts and between the carts is fine. That way it's a separate truck that comes and gets it. So, you know, the driver can empty the, the recycling, the driver can empty the trash, the driver can empty the organics, and then the cardboard driver is gonna come out and grab your stack of cardboard and put it in the truck. Just make sure it's flattened and empty. So take all that packing material, out. even if it's paper, take the packing material out. The cardboard is completely separate. We don't put paper in with the cardboard. It goes into the cardboard truck. Paper goes into the recycling bin. Next slide, please. We're really blessed to have such an amazing recycling program for cardboard. I mean, because we have so much cardboard and it's just so easy. It's an unlimited collection and it's free. So just flatten, stack it on the ground and you can recycle it. Okay, so where, what happens to our recycling? Where does it go? So yes, we do have a dual stream recycling program. We do keep stuff separate. Um, the collection trucks are all divided. I swear they really are. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so here's what happens when the truck picks up paper. Okay, so this is the picture on the upper left is um, a commercial truck um, that has picked up um, paper, paper, uh, paper carts from commercial from businesses. Um, so it's going to go into the recycling warehouse. It's going to empty the paper onto the, the sorting floor. A tractor is going to push all the paper to this conveyor belt, and it, it's going to go up the conveyor belt so that the workers can sort it. Next slide, please. For the bottles and cans, the truck is going to drive on the outside of the building, and it's going to empty all the bottles and cans into these bins that are outside um, of the recycling center or into this, just this big, they call it the, the cage, um, where all the plastics and metals and glass go out there. And then a truck will scoop it up and dump it into a hopper, which goes onto a conveyor belt to a sorting. Next slide, please. And then once it gets inside, it goes on this conveyor belt and there's workers there. And each worker has a different commodity that they're sorting for. Someone's pulling out aluminum, someone's pulling out, you know, a plastic number one, and someone's pulling out garbage. And then as they're pulling it out, they're throwing the, the recyclables um, down below into a chute and it goes into these big bays that fill up with material. When the bay fills up with material, they open the doors. It goes onto another conveyor belt. Next slide, please. And then it goes into um, a, uh, a baler and then it squishes everything down. It actually makes these big blocks, kind of looks like these big Legos and they all stack up in the warehouse. It's super cool if you've ever seen it. And these are so clean, so, so clean because we hand sort here in town. There's absolutely no way that machinery can get stuff this clean. I've toured uh, recycling facilities where you have got this high powered machinery and it doesn't look like this. Um, machinery cannot get as amazing as hands and brains. Um, the, also the amazing thing is that our recyclables that come into Recology's recycling facility have a very, very low um, residual rate to begin with. The, the amount of trash that's in there, the non-recyclables. In a traditional recycling facility, when you're looking at how much trash comes in with actual recyclables, um, the, usually it's anywhere from 12 to 25 percent trash in, in the recyclables. In Davis, five to seven percent because you guys in Davis, you rock at recycling. <laughs> you guys are so good at it. It is just so beautifully clean coming in and then the workers sort it out and it is just perfection going out. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so where do all the recyclables go? I've seen a lot of questions come in about this. Everybody wants to know, well, that's great, but I saw this documentary or I saw this video or I read this article. I get it, I get it. I read those too <laughs> and my heart breaks. Here's the thing that you have to keep in mind. So two different things. First of all, recycling is, is, is very, can be, can be local sometimes and recycling is based on the economy, but is also based on garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so here's what was happening. We were collecting recyclables, we in general, the United States, everyone, right? Collecting recyclables, not doing the best job sorting these things and shipping it overseas, hoping that someone would recycle it. Surprise, surprise, folks overseas got tired of receiving garbage as they should, right? Davis recyclables are clean, so clean that even when the market is down, they still want our stuff because we don't have garbage. We actually have clean stuff. So that's the first thing. We start off with higher quality paper 
than other communities because we keep our paper separate. Our paper doesn't have soda sticky stuff all over it. It's not, it's not gunky, it's not gross. It's paper, it's clean. So our stuff can have a higher quality and sell at a better rate. That's the first thing. The second thing is that our hauler follows the Basel Convention, which is kind of amazing because even the United States doesn't follow the Basel Convention. The Basel Convention states that they do not sell or send low-grade plastics overseas. So Recology doesn't. They've just decided that they wanted to do that. So they find local markets for their plastics instead. And again, we're a small community. We have clean stuff. They're able to do that. Where exactly does it go? Some of the, I can't remember because honestly, every time I ask, it changes because it's economies. It's it's things change and stuff. The last time I asked, the paper was going to Washington. I can't remember. There was somebody in Southern California that was taking the plastics. It changes all the time. Uh, Recology has a um, a report. Uh, Recology Corporate has a report that they post their sustainability report that talks about where they send all their stuff, and it changes year to year. It changes month to month depending on where the markets are. Um, but our materials are not landfilled. They are not landfilled. And that is the beautiful thing to take home. Our stuff is not landfilled. Our stuff is recycled. Sometimes it has to sit for a really long time to find a market, especially right now with the supply chain issues from COVID. Um, but our stuff is not getting landfilled. It is getting recycled. And they also did a cool thing. Um, when recycling carts break, when garbage carts break, um, they bail those up and they, they recycle those too. And what's cool about that is it actually has the Recology Davis logo on it or just a Recology logo or, or whatever, right? It has the logos on the cart. So what Recology did was they followed their shipping crates um, over to wherever they were sending them. There was some place overseas they were sending them. And when the shipping container was opened at the recycling facility, they looked through it until they could confirm that that was their bail because they could see their carts. So they're like, okay, this is our bail. I see our logo on these carts that are bailed. Okay. Show me what you guys do with these. And they sat there and they watched as this company processed the plastics to make sure that it was done in an environmental method. So this is something that Recology Corporate does to make sure that this stuff is, is taken care of environmentally. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not a Recology Corporate person. I'm not, that's their business. Their job is to, to process this stuff. My job is to make sure that people put it in the right bin. So we're gonna continue. Okay, where does our organics go? Um, next slide, please. Our organics is sent to the um, Yolo County landfill. Wait a minute, we send the organics to the landfill. You just start, you just told us, Jennifer, that we're not supposed to landfill these. Well, the landfill has three composting facilities. Three, did you guys know that there's three? There are three composting facilities at the Yolo County landfill. There's a, tr there's a traditional anaerobic composting, or sorry, a traditional aerobic composting facility with just the, the windrows where they compost stuff. Um, then there's an anaerobic decomposition facility that they actually built on top of a closed landfill cell, which is kind of awesome because a landfill when it's closed, it's kind of like useless space. So they built a digester on top of that, which is an amazing use of space. So they can compost stuff there and generate energy from it as well. So it's like a win-win. And then they also have a liquid um, digester too. So they have a depackager on site. So when like you know, a tomato company or something, they've got like crates and crates of, of product that was rejected for some reason, it went out of stock or out of supply or some, some reason why they have truckloads. It happens a lot, actually, I guess, when a company has to, you know, discontinue a product because there was a, a malfunction or an error or a quality thing. And you've got crates and crates of tomato sauce or ketchup or, or some food, but they're all in containers they can send it through a depackager, which grinds everything up, pulls out all the plastics and the metals for recycling and puts all like the liquid waste into a digester to compost it and pull energy out of and then make compost. It's an amazing, amazing process. The Yolo landfill, just up there, they have all of that going on. Um, so then everything is composted and then uh, it's, believe it or not, it's sold to a compost broker. Who knew that was a thing? Um, and the compost broker sells it to farmers. Um, they have free compost giveaways. Right now there's a compost giveaway, um, May and April, free compost to Yolo County residents. If you're a gardener like me and you're looking for some compost, uh, the Yolo County landfill, free compost, just bring some proof that you live in Yolo County and you can take compost for free. There's no limit, just residents only, no businesses, no landscapers. Uh, it's just something they do for, for residents. So you can literally, this is the stuff that we send them. You can get it back and you can spread it in your garden and Talk about closing the loop right there. That's pretty amazing. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then of course our trash, our trash is buried at the Yolo County landfill. Nobody sorts it out. So if you throw something in the trash, it stays in the trash. It's not coming back out again. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's my favorite part. The most common questions. A lot of these questions I'm seeing uh, coming up in the chat, it's great because I've got some slides for those. Some of them I might not have. So we'll make sure that uh, we can cover some of those other things too. Okay, so first question, next slide, please. The first question I get a lot, and I'm just gonna preempt this right here. I get, I keep getting asked, well, why doesn't the city accept this? Well, why don't you guys change your program? And how come you guys don't take cartons for recycling? And why don't you start taking toothpaste? Or, you know, this company has this, this program where you can pay and you can get a box and you can fill this box with stuff and they'll take it for you. And here's the thing. Yes, we are very aware of all those programs. And there's some great programs out there. Here's what I would turn that question on its head and ask. Why are producers making things that are not easily recyclable or not compostable. And that's the key. Recycling is not free. It takes money. It takes the money for, for collection. It takes money for processing. We have to ship it somewhere. Hope to high heaven that we can find some place to take it. It's not a cheap process and it's not easy. And it's made much more difficult when you have a product that is a complicated product. For example, an aluminum can. That's a simple product. It's just aluminum, very recyclable easy to find a place to take that. You get those aluminum cans and they put a plastic top on it. What am I supposed to do with that? It's an aluminum plastic, you can't recycle that. They've taken a product that could have been completely recyclable and they've ruined it. Now I can't recycle it. Or hey, how about a carton? That's my favorite one. We'll talk about cartons in a little bit, but let's take paper and we'll wrap it in plastic and metal and we'll call it environmental because you can recycle it, which is great. If you can find someone to recycle it, it's difficult. So why are producers making things that are so difficult to recycle? Yes, I know that you can buy a box and you can fill it with stuff and pay to have it recycled, but why are we paying to have this recycled? So there's a concept called extended producer responsibility. The city signed a resolution to support extended producer responsibility in 2011. And that concept is that manufacturers should be responsible for the end of life disposal of their own products. Why are they making toxic products when there's a non-toxic alternative? Why are we making single-use propane canisters, one-pound propane canisters, when you could have a reusable one, just like the five-gallon ones? You get a five-gallon propane canister, you don't throw it out, you refill it. You can get a one-pound propane canister and refill it too. They're, they're not the same as the single-use ones. It's a different one because they're refillable. Why are we making products that are so difficult to recycle? So we, we have power in our purchasing. So when you're going shopping for something, Take that extra moment to see if you can find a recyclable alternative. They're out there. They're not easy to find. And sometimes they're more expensive, unfortunately. But our money has power. If you cannot find something that is recyclable or compostable, write the manufacturer. It actually does make a difference. Here's the cool thing. The state is realizing how big of an issue this is. And in order to fight plastic pollution and deal with all these single-use plastics, unbelievably, <laughs> Last year, they passed Senate Bill 54, which I could not be more excited about. It is a major step in reducing plastic waste because it goes right to the heart of the matter of these producers that are creating products that cannot be recycled. So they have specific target dates where manufacturers have to have, you know, 30% or 50% or 75% of their products be recyclable, not just in theory recyclable, but actually accepted and recycled in a certain percentage of the community. I think it's like 75 to 80% of jurisdictions in California have to have viable product like programs that can actually take this. Because yeah, somewhere in the world, you can recycle cartons. Can you recycle them in Yolo County? No, 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 you can't. We don't have a program. We don't, it's, it doesn't exist here. It's difficult to recycle those. There's, they're expensive. We don't have that program here. It exists somewhere, but it's not recyclable here. So that wouldn't pass under this law. So there's steps that are being made, but it's it's looking at the system from a different lens. It's not it's not why why can't the government pay for a recycling program or, or why can't we just raise our tipping fees so that everybody pays for this? It's why are they making this? There's got to be a better solution to this. Okay, so I'll get off my soapbox. Next slide. Let's talk about what we can actually and cannot recycle. Okay. 
So when you're looking at a product and you're trying to decide if it's recyclable, I want you to try to think about these few tips here. So first of all, it has to be all one material, okay? It can't be a combination like I talked about, the aluminum can with the plastic lid. Sometimes there's a little bit of non-recyclable material in something, right? So you can give it eh, give it maybe 3 to 5% contamination factor, okay? So if if 90% or sorry, if 95 or more percent of something is all one material, you can we'll let you recycle that. But if it's more than five, three to five percent, you're gonna have to, it's not recyclable. So those little pods that have coffee in them, the single things, no way. Those are filled with coffee grounds, there's plastic, it's just, is metal, all sorts of crazy stuff on that, it's not recyclable. It also has to be clean, okay? So give it a rinse, scrape it out, make sure it's clean. Plastics, again, has to be rigid. Glass, only food and beverage containers. And paper, like I said, staples are okay, all other fasteners have to be removed. So no, no clippy clappy thingies on them or, or the binder edges that they have on, on like reports and stuff like that. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, somebody asked about toothpaste. And this is funny because toothpaste is super crazy because it's like the plastic cap and then it seems to be plastic, but it's not exactly rigid. And here's two ex almost identical plastic uh, toothpaste containers, but on the back of them, one of them says it's recyclable while the other one does not. Here's the crazy thing about toothpaste. Next slide, please. I actually ripped open one of these because I'm kind of a nerd about that. Oh man, it's tilted sideways, you can't tell. Okay, well, if you can kind of see the inside of it's metal. So it actually has an aluminum foil lining on the inside and then another layer of plastic. So this is plastic and metal all wrapped together and all sorts of craziness. This needs to go in the trash. So this is not recyclable, definitely not recyclable. Uh, next slide, please. So if you get something that's kind of funky and you're just really not sure, it's probably trash. If you cannot figure it out, it probably needs to go into the trash. So compostable, if you're trying to figure out if it can be compostable, ask yourself if it's made out of a plant or animal and does it contain any glass, metal, or plastic? And if it has just the teeniest little bit of, of plastic, maybe it's okay, maybe. Here's the thing, acceptability of compost may change, okay? And that is just the fact. We do not own our composting facility, the Yellow County Landfill does and they really want to have high quality compost. So their compost facility is new. They just got it up and running and they've been doing all sorts of testing on it to find out, you know, get it all fine tuned, what works, what doesn't, get all of their composting systems sorted out. And they do screen the compost at the end. So after it's all finished, they run through a screener to kind of screen out stuff um, and it pulls out plastics and stuff, but there's some stuff that goes through. So they're, they're assessing things right now. They may determine that there's too much plastic in there or that they can't take cartons anymore or something. They may determine that. And we have to, we have to adjust. Um, it, that's not my call. It's their facility. And let's face it, we want that compost to be nice, right? This is something that we're spreading in our communities and our lands all around us. We want that to be clean. We don't want to be spreading plastic. We don't want to be spreading garbage. So we rely on the Yolo County landfill to produce the compost for us that is of the highest quality. And so if they tell us that we can't accept this anymore, that is the way that it is. Um, so for now, this is what we can accept and, and everything that I'm telling you, of, of, we can accept, this is what it is right now. Um, if you'd like to know when something changes, you should sign up for our Greener Davis newsletter. And many of you might be here because you receive our newsletter. And, and if you are, Thank you. I'm so glad that you receive our newsletter. Um, I'll have a link to it at the end of the presentation, but you can also go to greenerdavis.org. It's our, our website and uh, sign up for the news, the, um, our newsletter right there. It goes out monthly. It's free and it tells you all the environmental stuff that's happening in Davis. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's another question that I get a lot and I love this question because I love the looks on their faces when I tell them the answer. I don't need an organic spin. Why do I need an organic spin? I don't generate organic waste. I don't buy organic products. And then I look and I see, well, you've got a Kleenex box on your desk. That, that's organic waste. Or you take takeout food, that's organic waste. Or you use paper towels, that's organic waste. So again, I'm trying to get people to understand organic waste is not necessarily what they might think it is. It is so much broader than that. So much of our waste is organic waste. <laughs> that it's really important to understand that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, do I need to use a compostable bag? No, you don't. It's a good idea, but you don't have to. I don't use a compostable bag in my house. 
I use paper bags, cereal boxes, cardboard boxes, whatever we have. Uh, I have a video that we put on our YouTube of how to fold uh, a liner out of newspaper and put it in your kitchen collection pail. Um, I would recommend that you put food waste in something before you put it in your organics cart, just because if you're just dumping food waste directly into your organics cart, it's going to get kind of stinky in there. So I would recommend you always either put some cardboard at the bottom or some yard waste or keep your food waste in your freezer until pickup day and then you can put it in your cart or wrap it in a newspaper or something. Put it in something compostable before adding it to your organics cart. It's just for cleanliness. It's not required, but you know, people don't like stinky carts and maggots. So if you want to avoid that, wrapping it up in something compostable is a good idea. Just no plastic bags. If you want to collect your organic waste at home in a plastic lined bin, go right ahead. But empty the contents into the bin. Do not put the plastic bag into the organics bin. Next slide, please. Do I need to rinse it? I've covered this already, but give it a quick rinse. It doesn't need to be pristine. We just don't want gunky stuff on there. Next slide, please. And then cartons. Okay, this is the number one question I get is cartons. Can we recycle them? No. But as of right now, we can put some of them into the organic spin, some of them. And this is where it gets tricky. If you can remove the cap, well, remove the cap. Okay, put the cap in the trash. Remove the spout if you can. Sometimes we can't, it's fine. If you can do it, go ahead. Someone was asking about plastic caps. Can we recycle those little plastic caps? So yes and no, because things are confusing. That's life, right? So if it's a plastic cap that you can squeeze on or put onto a plastic bottle that's recycled, go ahead and recycle it. If it's a plastic cap all by itself, like that toothpaste lid or this cap, put it in the trash. And here's why. Because it's so tiny, it's not going to stay on those bales. If it happens to get in the middle of the bale, that's great. But if it gets on the outside of those, the baled plastic, it's just going to fall off at some point and create litter. And we don't want that. So if, if, if you have a tiny little plastic item, like if it's small, like a cap, screw it onto the bottle if you're recycling the bottle. Otherwise, it has to go into the trash because we don't want to create litter. Okay, next slide, please. So you said some cartons are recyclable and some are not, or compostable and some are not. So that's crazy, Jennifer. What do you mean by that? Okay, so there's two different kinds of um, cartons. When you buy them in a store, there's the cartons that have to be refrigerated, right? And then there's the shelf stable cartons, right? You've seen that. So when you go to the store and you're buying a carton and it says on the carton, refrigerate, like always refrigerate, not refrigerate after opening, but refrigerate. That is a refrigerated carton. That is currently compostable, okay? Currently compostable. So what that is, it's a thick layer of paper with a piece of plastic on the inside and the outside. Currently, that's apparently compostable. It might not be in the future. Shelf stable cartons, however, is just a whole bucket of mess. It's basically a functional can because it's a thick layer of, pla of paper, but then it has plastic and then aluminum and then plastic and then plastic on the outside too. Okay, so it's just, just a big bucket of mess. We can't do anything with that. There's so little paper in comparison to everything else that's there, we cannot compost that. And we don't have a recycling system for it. Yes, there is a, an option to recycle it. Um, the Carton Council, which is a recycling organization, they can set up a milk run where if we can collect all these things, they can pick it up. But in order to collect these, they would have to add a new sorting station to or the operations or ecology, which would be really expensive to collect something that should have been manufactured better. So it's not something we can do right now. Our focus is, is less on getting these small products that are difficult to recycle. That is not our focus. Our focus is the climate change aspect of these regulations and getting organics out of landfill. So yes, I know there's, there's recycling programs for pens. There's recycling pro programs for crayons and corks and cartons. Our focus is on getting those organics out of the landfill. That is what is the most important thing right now because we've got to get that methane gas to stop um, emitting from these landfills. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I actually took a carton and opened it up because I'm kind of a geek about stuff like that. And I, you can actually see, I don't know if you can see in the picture on the left, I, I was able to peel up the aluminum from the inside. It's plastic and aluminum. You can actually do that. It's really interesting. So that's a shelf stable carton. And the one on the right is a refrigerated carton. And it's got that annoying little plastic cap at the top too. Okay, so that's cartons. Next slide, please. Okay, so plastic bags, can you recycle plastic bags? So not in your recycling carts, 
but there are some grocery stores that will take them back for recycling. Um, a lot of grocery stores used to take them back because state law said they had to. That state law ended in January 2020, nothing to do with the pandemic. That was just the, when the law ended. And when that law ended, we started seeing more and more stores stop their recycling programs because the law didn't require it anymore. Unfortunately, film plastics like um, plastic bags, it's really difficult to recycle those. So I don't really I'm not really surprised that a lot of stores um, stop taking them. Um, some more local stores have told me that they could not find any place to take them for recycling. So they stopped them because they just couldn't do anything with the material. Um, and that's what our recycler has always told us is that they can't find a buyer except for an incinerator and they don't consider incineration recycling. Neither do I. So they don't take it back. I don't know where these stores are taking them. They might be able to backhaul them all the way down to Southern California where there's a vendor there that can turn them in back into plastic bags. I don't know where it goes. I really don't. Um, but there are some stores that do have take back programs still and it changes who's taking them and, and what times. Next slide, please. Okay, books. I love this question. Can I recycle books? Well, the best way to recycle a book is to reuse it because books are precious. But occasionally we have books that are just are really out of date encyclopedias or textbooks from the 50s that are no longer valid or something. We've got to recycle them. Yes, you can recycle um, paperback books in your recycling cart. If you have a hardback book, you have to remove the spine, not just the binding, the, the cover, but the cover, sorry, not just the cover, but the cover and the binding. So just remove the spine, basically rip all the pages out. Um, and then the pages can be recycled and then the binding and the cover need to go into the trash. Okay, next slide. Shipping bags. I'm sorry, I usually try to like block out brand names. So I'm not talking brand. It's almost impossible to block this one out. It's just everywhere. But okay, so if you have shipping bags, we'll just call them that. And they're like plastic bubbly stuff. That's not recyclable. There's these amazing ones that say, uh, recycle me like a box. Don't recycle it. It's not recyclable. Um, I've checked. Uh, it's not recyclable locally. They don't want it. So um, it, I put them in the organics, but um, I, I, I don't even know what to do with this, honestly. There's not a ton of these out there anymore. I haven't seen them for a while. So I don't know if, if this company will just say gave up on them. I'm not sure. Um, in some communities that might be recyclable, um, they might be compostable. So far, everybody I've asked says it's, it's just not the best idea and they should be landfilled. Um, I hold on to the hope that there's enough recyclable or enough compostable components to this that it would be okay. Um, jury's out on this one, unfortunately. It's difficult. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so that's all the FY, the frequently asked questions that I have. Um, I know I've had a lot of other folks um, submit questions and stuff that we can get to in a bit, but um, you know, I know that folks want to know about when changes are coming or, or what's going on environmentally. When is the next compost free giveaway event at the landfill or when are we having another shred event or, or anything like that? Um, I recommend that you sign up for our newsletter. It is free. Um, we don't spam you with a ton of stuff. You just get our newsletter. Um, so you can sign up at Greener Davis. Uh, follow us on social media. We're fun. Um, we've got recycling memes and water conservation memes and then all sorts of, you know, fantastic information about what's going on in Davis environmentally. We're at Greener Davis. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Next slide, please. And if you like to do stuff on the computer, because you're all, you're all Zoomers here, so hopefully we all like to do some computer stuff. We do have a zero waste game that was created by some fantastic Sacramento State um, web design students as part of their senior project. They made this for us for free. It's super fun. Um, go on to greenerdavis.org, um, go to games. You can go to this game and test yourself after taking this webinar. See how good you are at sorting waste. See if you can sort 75% of your waste into the right bin. It's like Tetris where stuff falls, but you have to sort it into the correct bin. It's super fun. So challenge yourself and, and your housemates and see who can do best at sorting their waste. It's fun. Next slide, please. And our website, davisrecycling.org, has everything you ever wanted to know about recycling, but we're afraid to ask because um, I'm kind of a recycling and compost geek. So I've packed it full of flyers and, and videos and links and all sorts of stuff. So um, you can find out all that's going on here in Davis uh, recycling wise here as well. And I think, uh, next slide, I think that is the end of my presentation. Whew. So if anybody, I know we got a lot of questions. 
So hopefully I've covered a lot of those, but I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions that you folks have. So uh, Jan, take it away. First of all, I wanna thank you for um, just a great presentation. I hope everybody's enjoyed it so far and let's dive into the questions because time is short right now. So uh, for ones that I think have been answered, I'm not gonna, I hope you'll excuse me for not answering those or posing those to Jennifer, but I'm gonna quickly move through the ones that we didn't answer from what I could see. Uh, person said, I live in South Davis. Where can we pick up the compost created from all our organic waste. So it's, you said the, you know, at the landfill, but is there a special place that people can go for that? Um, once you go to the landfill, to the scale house, they will direct you where the compost is. You do have to bring your own buckets and shovels or bins and bags, whatever. So bring everything with you and they'll, they'll direct you to the place where it's at. Uh, are there any consequences for people who are not sorting properly right now? I think in Woodland, the trucks have cameras and residents get fined. So um, our trucks have cameras too, or ecology trucks, I should say, they're not my trucks. They have cameras just so the, the drivers can see. So we are not giving fines for contamination at this point. Starting in 2024, that ability kind of gets taken away from us. So January, 2024, the state requires that anytime there is a violation of the SB 1383 regulations that we are required to issue a notice of violation. And within 90 days, if it is not remedied, we are required to issue a fine. I don't get to give, be lenient on that. Now the regulations do not specifically say that contamination is a fine. Like that is not, the regulations do not require us to fine for contamination. City of Davis law has, has given us that ability since 2016. So we have had that ability since 2016. We've never fined anybody for that because we prefer to work with people. What, the, what you can get fined for is if a business is not educating their employees, if they do not have bins available for their customers, if they don't have bins available for their employees, that kind of thing. So I like to think of it as upstream versus downstream problem. So I see a bin that's contaminated. That's a downstream problem. Okay, what? let's look upstream. What's going on? Are they not being told by their landlord how to recycle? Are they not, uh, do they not have bins inside that business so that their employees can recycle? Like what's going on? I'm looking at the problem, uh, the, the symptom of the problem. Okay, this is the symptom. I'm not gonna deal with the symptom. I need to find out what's going on. And so that's the way that we look at enforcement as far as waste goes. We're not gonna find anybody from having a bin that's full of recyclables unless literally they just, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't even imagine a time, right? Because it's, you don't know, you might put your stuff in your bin and it's beautiful and it's perfect. And you roll it out to the curb and somebody comes by and just drops a bag of trash in there. You can't do anything about that. There's nothing that you could have done to prevent that. That's not your fault. I'm not gonna find you for that. That would be ridiculous. So no, it's we're not gonna find people for something like that. We wanna work with people to get them to where they need to be. Jennifer, just to be clear on one question, um, in case people are not or uncertain, uh, our congregations, uh, religious congregations and their facilities, they're, 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 are they considered businesses? Yes, they are. Under state law, it's considered a business. Any business or organization, regardless of whether or not it's nonprofit or not, including the city, <laughs> we fall under business. So we are required to follow all those regulations that were on that one slide that I went through super, super fast, but I'm happy to send this information out and explain it, um, that we are required to follow all those regulations as well. So somebody raised just a generic question about toothpaste tubes. How do you know which ones are and aren't? <laughs> they are all not recyclable. All, so anything you see that's like that, that's kind of like a squeezy thing, you know, like a lot of cosmetic products are like that. Not, not like a shampoo bottle, but like any kind of a squeezed tube. I guess you could look at it that way. If it's a tube of any sorts, it's not recyclable. It's a combination of plastic and metal often. It's not a rigid plastic. So that does not count. Okay. Um... So many people do not recycle. We need to have some kind of empowerment system, empowering system in place. I think you've covered that one. Um, uh, ends up in the landfill because there are a few markets for plastics. I think you've covered that one. Um, my understanding is that wet cardboard is not recyclable and has the potential to contaminate dry cord, uh, uh, cardboard. Is that true? I have not heard that from Ecology because they pick up cardboard on the street even when it's raining. Their preference is that it's not wet. Um, wet cardboard causes some issues 
when it, uh, it, it it's heavier for one thing, so the trucks can get too heavy too quickly, which is challenging for them. And then when it's bailed, <laughs> you squeeze it, all the water comes out and it makes a mess. I've never heard that it's not recyclable though. Okay. Um, uh, what do I do with old clothes, pillows and other fabrics and fibers? So pillows, unfortunately, there's no recycling program for us. So that would have to go into the landfill unless there's a shelter that wants to take it for animals. Um, so fabrics and textiles, there is a recycling program at the Yolo County landfill. It's run through them. It's not from us. They have put together an amazing program. Um, the clothes that and linens that are usable are um, taken for reuse and, and resell for, um, there's a vendor that they work with and the ones that are not um, able to be reused, they send them to, I can't remember where it goes, but they make them into rugs. Someplace overseas, they make them into these beautiful little rugs, but they don't take fabric scraps. That's, it's actually like clothes and stuff. So if you have like a bag of scraps or something, they don't take those, but um, the landfill has the details of what they don't take and they do take on their website. Uh, next question. If toxic pesticides were used on plants that people have put on the street for pickup, then would the compost be organic? Our, the compost is not considered organic. No, it is not. Um, the facility where the stuff goes currently is not an organic composting facility. Um, organic composting facilities, um, it is extremely rigorous testing program that they go through to become organic and currently that facility is not um to become organic i i don't know all the details um but it's a it's a whole series of hoops they have to jump through so it's not an organic composting facility okay um if something is both recyclable as paper and compostable is it better to put it with the paper or compost Oh, I love that question. Kudos to whoever asked that. Um, so it is better to recycle it. So because recycling, you know, the fibers themselves get reused. And so it can come back as a new paper product. Um, if it can't be recycled, compost is the next option. Um, in fact, we tell people if your, recycle, if your recycle bin is ever too full and you can't put any more paper in there and you just need to get rid of some paper, you always can put it into the organics bin because then at least you know, it can still be um, composted. If you can't hold on to it until the next week, right? Um, it can be composted, but that's a really good question. Recycling is is higher up on the hierarchy than, than composting. Okay. Um, I wrap organic waste in newsprint. Where does it go? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, that's a really good idea to wrap it in newsprint and then it can go into the organics bin. That's really good best practices. Good job. Okay, I'm trying to keep up with it. Only a few more questions left, but I have to go back and check here. Uh, often lids to jars are metal, but some have plastic under the lid to make a good seal. It sounds like it is not recyclable because it's both metal and plastic. Is that correct? So if it's like, um, I'm thinking like pasta sauce jars, right? Like a pasta sauce jar, it's a metal jar, it's a metal lid, but then it has like a little bit of plastic underneath the lid to have a good seal. That's fine. That's still completely recyclable. Um, I know that there's like some some plastic containers will have um, a metal lid and then it has like plastic around the lid. So it's like metal and plastic on the lid. That one's a funkier one. I think that one would have to go into the trash. Um, but if it's just like a little film of like sprayed plastic on the bottom of the lid to help create a seal, that's fine. That can still be recycled. And and that uh, magic question: What about cling wrap? Oh, that's trash. I know, isn't that sad? That's why that beeswax wrap is so great because you can, you know, it's just the beeswax and and you know uh, you can use it again and again. But yeah, cling wrap, plastic wrap, that's just garbage, unfortunately. Yeah, there's another one here. What about Hello Fresh packing? I'm not sure what that is. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So there's a lot of companies that do um, that. You know, you can order. Um, I think I can hear the truck right now bringing me my fresh uh, uh, farm groceries. Um, when you buy like produce and stuff, and and they they bring you their produce, um, and it comes with like some gel packaging that's like frozen or something. And uh, it says some of it will say the gel is recyclable or the gel is compostable. 
I don't know what's actually in there. I mean, it, some of that's proprietary, so they don't actually tell you the components that's in there. So I, I would not, I would not compost that. I would not recycle that. I would put that into the trash because who knows what kind of other chemicals are in there. So unfortunately, no, I think that needs to go into the trash. If it's the cold packs that they're talking about, if it's not the cold packs, then um, you can send me a picture. Uh, my email is jgilbert. It's very simple, jgilbert at cityofdavis.org. Send me an email with a picture, um, and I can help you figure out the details on that item. Uh, I missed this other question. It was submitted earlier. Do you need to remove all tape and labels from cardboard before recycling? That's a really good question. No, you do not. Um, it's fine to leave them on. However, I would say if you are using your cardboard for sheet mulching in your yard, I recommend removing the plastic tape because otherwise years down the road when you're gardening in that lovely area, you're going to be taking out all that tape from your from your soil. <laughs> but recycling is fine. They can take that out of there. Okay. What about aluminum foil? Aluminum foil is perfectly recyclable. Just make sure that it's clean. Okay. Um... Let's see, what about scraps of paper rather than full sheets? Better to compost or recycling? Oh, that is such a fantastic question. You know, I kind of struggle with that sometimes too. I tell myself if it's smaller than a third or a quarter sheet, like if it's smaller than a quarter sheet, I usually put it in compost because a couple things, right? When the recycling truck is emptying it, if there's any kind of breeze, it's blown out of the truck, right? And it's litter. And then again, when it's being baled, if it's too small, it'll fall out of the bale. So if it's a if it's smaller than I say a quarter or a third of a sheet, I would put it in the compost. While I'm on that topic, because I forgot to bring this up, receipts. If you have receipts, they're actually mostly not paper. Receipts need to go into the trash. A lot of receipts these days are thermal receipts, and there's all sorts of different kind of chemicals in there. Plus, it's it's really co coated in heavy plastic, so receipts need to go into the trash. Okay, another question. If plastic spouts on milk containers go to compost, can cat food bags with thin film liners go to compost? Ooh, that's another good question. That's an awful lot of plastic though. I think that's pretty thick. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, see, so much of this is sort of subjective, right? I mean, how much contamination is allowed, right? Until we get clarification from the county uh, about how much plastic is okay, technically it's allowed. Um, I would say if you can pull that inner liner out, some cat food bags and dog food bags you can. Um, if you can pull that out, that would be the ideal, but otherwise it probably can go in. But again, the county may may change their stand on that, and then we have to we have to um, comply with their their new guidelines. What about tissue paper for wrapping packages? Oh yeah, that's a good one. It's not recyclable, but that is compostable. So reuse it first until you can't reuse it anymore because it's torn into little bitty bits and then go ahead and compost it. Okay, I think we've answered most of the questions that weren't clearly answered in your presentation. But if for some reason you believe it wasn't, since we have a little bit of time left, would you re-enter it please? Anybody who feels that their question that you posted earlier, I might've made a mistake like one, I missed completely, but if it, your question wasn't answered, would you just repost it again? Give it a few awesome. minutes for that. Um, and then um, the, the shred, well, I should mention, Recology has a shred event that was originally scheduled for April 29th. So if you put that on your calendar, please note that the date has changed to May 6th. Unfortunately, the vendor that was providing the services for the shredding is no longer available on the 29th. So they had to move the event to May 6th. How many boxes can we bring, Jennifer? I think it's two boxes. I believe it is two boxes, like two file boxes worth. Okay, thank you. Um, so some more stuff is coming in. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, the first one, is, well, there's a number here, but I'll start with, what about dog poop? Ooh, dog poop. Dog poop needs to go into the trash. <laughs> the composting true. facility is literally not uh, certified to take that. It is, there's too many pathogens involved. So it needs to go into the trash. Do not leave it in your yard. Pick it up. Always, 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 always pick it up. It contributes to um, poor water quality and, and bacteria and stuff when it washes off and decomposes elsewhere. Okay. Please confirm that the removed plastic caps from milk cartons are not recyclable because they're too small. That is correct. Plastic caps of any sort, if it is not placed onto a bottle, 
that is going to be recycled. If the plastic cap is by itself, it should go into the trash. Okay. Um, what is done with plastic by whoever takes it? It depends on who takes it. So the first thing they do is they wash it. Uh, well, sometimes they wash it first. Sometimes they shred it first, um, depending on the type. Um, after it is washed and shredded, it's typically melted down into um, pellets. Sometimes they just shred it into tiny little, um, they're called nurdles. Uh, it depends on the facility. Um, and then once they're down into the pelletized or, or shredded versions, then it's bagged up and shipped um, to where it's, you know, so there's there's the, the processing and then that's shipped to take those those nurdles or the shreds and to, to make into new products. It's actually really interesting to see. Um, are, is, gift, is, is a gift wrap paper recyclable? It is as long as there's no foil on it. So, you know, when you go buy a gift wrap, some of it's like really shiny and like kind of metallic looking, that's not recyclable. So avoid that kind of, of wrapping paper. As long as it's not that kind, it is recyclable. Okay. How about soft-sided uh, yogurt containers? Are they, are they trash? Um, no, that's recyclable. And, okay. And um, one more pass on the caps and, uh, uh, and glass uh, beverage containers. Should we leave caps on plastic and glass beverage containers when recycling? Okay, so if it's a glass beverage container, no, you need to take it off because that is, um, they don't make glass glass caps. That would be really interesting if they did. Um, so if it's a glass container, take the cap off. If it's a metal cap, you can go ahead and put it in the recycling. If it is a plastic cap, it would go into the trash. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Uh, okay. We have that. Wow. Um, I think we've gone through all of the questions so far. Fantastic. And I see a number of accolades out here for your presentation, Jennifer. Um, oh, good. You know, glad. So I'm, you know, very grateful for your evening. I, there's a lot of things coming up now. Oh, it says a thin sod goes to compost, but what about yard diggings with more dirt than greens? What's the dividing line dirt to green ratio? That is a very good question. So, okay, two things there. So the compost facility composts green stuff, not dirt. So a little bit of residual dirt is okay. How much is okay? How much is not okay? So here we get to the subjective part again, right? There's there's two issues at play. We don't want tons of dirt going to the compost facility because the compost facility is supposed to be producing compost. When you get compost back, you don't want to get someone's dirt. You want the compost. You want that organic material so that you could work that into your soil to increase the organic content. You want dirt. Small amount of dirt is okay. Large amount of dirt is not okay. Here's the tipping point. Your, or your cart itself has a weight limit. It can't exceed a certain weight limit or legit the truck cannot pick it up. <laughs> if it's too heavy, the Recology truck will not be able to lift that cart off the ground. So when you're, when you're removing a lawn and you've got a lot of sod, shake as much dirt off of that as you can. Because yes, first of all, the compost facility does not want dirt. But secondly, your cart is gonna be too heavy if you fill it with sod. So if you've got a whole bunch of sod because you're removing a lawn, you need to find an alternative. You can either bring it to the landfill yourself if you have a truck, or you can contact Recology and get like a 10 yard dumpster or something to put that in and then have it hauled to the landfill. They can't take it in the composting facility, but they can use it elsewhere in the landfill as dirt. Um, but it can't go, you can't fill it the carts past the weight limit. Um. It's a great question. What about the annoying plastic packaging around batteries and other packaged items that oh. that, that can can it be recycled? The kind that holds its shape. Yes. Uh, what is that called? The, our industry has a term for that too. I think it's called frust wrap, like frustration wrap. But yes, I know what you mean. Like the stuff that's like impossible to break open until you get scissors and then you almost cut your hand off because it's sharp. You guys all know what I'm talking about. That bubble bubble packaging. Um, yes, that stuff. So it is It is a, a rigid plastic, so you can recycle it. I, I do want to say, I think that is the kind of plastic that they're having a hard time finding a market for. Mm -hmm. So here's what I would say. Go ahead and put it in your recycling bin. If Recology can't recycle it, they won't. And this is what they do with those low, low-grade plastics that they can't recycle right now. They sort them out. 
So we, we don't tell people not to put it in the recycling bin because at any moment the market changes and they can take it again and they'll start positively sorting it. But while it's not accepted, and I, I don't quote me on this because again, the market changes so fast, but that might be one of the commodities that they don't have a market for right now. And so it might be negatively sorted right now into trash, but again, it would change again and we would take it back. So that's why we never tell people that anything changes because it can shift. And that's, that's the way that it is. So right now, everything is that their bailing is being recycled. And I don't know if right now that is on the positive sort or the negative sort. So uh, two questions about links. Can you put the link to the recycle game in the chat or email? I could try. Uh, or maybe we can, um, you know, we can, can we send that out to everybody that's attended? Let's do that because if maybe I click on anything it. on my computer, I don't want to shut my computer down. My yeah. computer's tired. It's been running since 6 a.m. So it's a little tired. So yeah, we can do that. And then there is another one. Plastic, uh, some more some more questions here. Uh, can you repeat your email uh, address again, Jennifer? Of course. It's my it's my first initial, J, and my last name, Gilbert, at cityofdavis.org. So all one word. There's no dashes. Okay. Uh, plastic berry tubs. We, we, I'm mixing things up because they're coming in here. We want to get as many as we can before we end here. we got two more minutes left. Yeah, definitely. Plastic berry tubs again. That's a, that's a rigid plastic. So go ahead and put that in your recycling bin. So the other big question uh, is: Is there any hope the industry will get on board? They have to. They have no choice than to get on on board. That's the beauty of SB fifty four, and they're doing the rulemaking process right now. They were um, they were looking at applications for people to be on the, the statewide committee to write the regulations. And I was so tempted. I really wanted to do it, but my, my workload is too heavy. And I, I am, I really want to focus on organics right now with the city of Davis, but we are following that very closely because that is going to be, I believe it is going to be what's going to tip the, the market for plastics is because California is just not taking it anymore. And um, the single use plastics is, is going to be addressed with this law. Manufacturers have to make stuff that is recyclable. They have to show that it's being recycled. They have to pay millions of dollars in fees to help clean up the litter that is the plastic litter in our communities. Um, so it, it, in so many different ways, this bill is just, is just what we've been needing. It's really exciting. Well, I, we are literally right at 8.30. There's no further uh, burning questions, and I'm sure you all have Jennifer's, or now you have her email address for any other additional questions you might want to send to her. Um, as Chris just posted, we'll send the link to you uh, to the video uh, and follow up uh, contact links, including the games. So um, thank you all so much. First of all, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Chris, my colleagues here who really make this presentation what it is. And you know, thank you all most of all, because people say, what can I do? We worry about the legislation in Washington. We worry about what the city does. We worry about what the county does. You can make a difference every day by what you put in those cards. And it sounds like it's an important difference. So um, if I hope you'll all join all of us. I think we'll make some kind of pledge, whatever, to be better citizens by sorting our trash better. And um, thank you all for what you probably already do. And thank you for coming to this because I'm sure I thought I knew a lot. I don't know about the rest of you, but I sure got a lot of answers. Anthony's raising his hand. I'll give him one more shot. Get, uh, Anthony, let's open you up for a quick question here. Oh, I think that was a clapping. That was, oh, a, was a clapping. That oh, was a clapping. thank you. <laughs> okay, all oh, great. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us and uh, uh, great talking trash is what I'm getting <laughs> at the end of this statement. So hopefully we'll see you in another, uh, you know, another presentation that we bring together. I want to thank the city for being a great partner with the Interfaith and with Cool Davis. And I hope we have more of these. I know we've done them in the past and I look forward to more of these as more relevant and important issues come up related to climate change. Be well, everyone. Good night.
Well, folks, well, Kevin, there you go. Kevin's up there.